Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. It is February the 14th, 2019. Let's talk about the O.J. Simpson case a little bit more. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I've made a video on this case. I want everyone to understand my point of view. Right? I believe O.J. Simpson is the person who killed Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. Right? I believe O.J. is the murderer. That's my opinion based on the evidence. But, in this case, like the Kennedy assassination, deserves a but. This is that rare case where, to me, you can't trust the integrity of the evidence. Right? One man's opinion. I've read the comments here online. Many people are thrown by some pieces of evidence. Understand, I believe O.J. was just one of the bad actors here. I believe it's clear based on a few pieces of evidence that we'll go over, a few problems, we'll call them. Right? I believe it's clear that the police did some things wrong here. Right? Let's talk about just some, because the case is so rich, just some of the problems in the case that really warrant your attention. Right? While I believe O.J. did the crime, I wouldn't have convicted him because of the problems with the evidence. Well, let's talk about just some of the problems. It's a short video here today. The bloody socks. Now, we can come up with explanations as to why one police video doesn't show the socks on the floor, and then another police video stamped after the first one suddenly shows bloody socks on the floor. Okay, it's 1994. I get it. These cameras weren't synchronized. Uh, some of the time stamping might be incorrect. Now think about how ridiculous that claim is. Folks, it's a murder investigation. Worse yet, it's a high-profile murder investigation. And folks are going to talk about how time stamps on videotapes might be inaccurate. At a minimum, at a minimum, that's sloppy. But then we hit the next level. The blood drops on the bloody sock. Understand, if there's a foot in the sock, isn't that the theory? That the murderer wore the socks during the murders? Right? If there's a foot in the sock, then if blood splashes on the sock, the drop would stop on one side, right? In other words, here's a piece of paper. Blood splashes on this side. It shouldn't hit this second side over here if there's a foot in between the two of them. Now, it gets provocative because, of course, the blood drops are consistent on both sides of the sock. It's as if someone dropped blood on the sock that seeped into the other side of the sock to such a degree that there's hardly any degradation. In other words, 
The socks are consistent with someone just dropping blood on the sock that goes all the way through to the other side. Now I'll agree that if you follow the timeline and if OJ did the killing then when OJ gets back to Rockingham he doesn't have a lot of time he has a limo driver Alan Park waiting for him he has to take off the socks quickly then he has to run out to the limo driver if he's just done the murders and he lives two miles away from the murder site, right? Two miles. If you're going 60 miles an hour, that's just a two minute trip, isn't it? Right? A mile a minute. Right? Let's say he did the murders and then is home in a matter of minutes. It could be that the sock's so bloody that when he takes it off and puts it on the floor, the blood on the top then seeps to the bottom. But understand, there was a trial. The defense had an expert talk about how the socks looked like someone had just put blood on top that seeped to the bottom and the defense really had no explanation they didn't talk about what I'm talking about here the idea that he just took the sock off and maybe the blood on one side just magically seeped into the other side to the same extent let's just say while the prosecution offered a lot of evidence, they were extremely weak. Extremely weak in dealing with the blood seepage on the sock. You combine that with the fact that the sock doesn't even appear on a videotape presumably made before the second tape, according to the timestamps of the police department. And to me, this sock evidence then becomes questionable. Right? It becomes less than convincing. Worse yet, it undercuts the credibility of the other evidence, because then you start asking yourself, well, who collected this evidence? LAPD. If I can't trust them here, how can I trust their collection of the other evidence? Let's talk about another problem. Right? And keep in mind, this is from someone who thinks OJ is guilty. We'll make several videos here because this case is one of the more remarkable cases of the last century. Right, let's talk about another piece of evidence that, quite frankly, should raise your eyebrow. Now, I want you to think about how long it takes blood to dry. Right, let's say you cut yourself. You bleed on a shirt or something like that. How long does it take the blood to dry on that shirt? What I also want you to do is to consider the time period of six and a half hours. Right? Six and a half hours. If you have a bloody shirt or a bloody glove, six and a half hours later, would you expect that shirt or glove? To still be bloody or would the blood dry now let's say OJ committed these murders right you have an ear witness Robert Hystra who hears two men arguing at about 10 40 p.m. that night 
let's get the time period right. Right around 10.40 p.m. Let's say O.J. makes it to his car. And there's evidence, by the way, that the person who does the crime, who's wearing Bruno Maglia shoes, walks to the car, comes back to the crime scene, walks back to the car. Walk, not run. So let's say that's O.J. Simpson. <clears throat> and I believe it was. Well, O.J. would have then, just looking at the timeline, dropped the bloody glove that they found at Rockingham at the earliest, 10.45, 10 10.50 p.m. Right? Think it through. Let's say the guy walking his dog, Robert Heister, is wrong. And let's say we can move the timeline up five minutes to 10.35. Well, understand, the earliest OJ would be able to drop the glove would be about 10.45, wouldn't it? Now, we keep hearing about Mark Furman finding this glove. Let's be clear on when he finds the glove. Folks, he finds the glove at approximately 5.30 a.m. the next morning. 5.30 a.m., more than six and a half hours later. Right? We're just looking at the facts of the case, looking at the testimony. Well, would it surprise you to know that the glove, when it's found, is still moist? Folks, it's moist more than six hours after the murder. Something here isn't quite right. Especially since Furman jumps the fence at the Rockingham estate without a search warrant. Especially when Furman was involved in the case before Van Adder and Lang. Right, Furman's at the crime scene before those other guys. Understand that F. Lee Bailey on the defense team did an experiment a year later the crime takes place June the 12th 1994 so in June of 1995 F. Lee Bailey does an experiment he has a doctor put three cubic centimeters of blood on two gloves he puts one glove in a Ziploc bag the kind that he claims that detectives have in the trunks of their cars when they come across evidence, right? It's a Ziploc bag. He puts the other glove where this glove was found, the O.J. Simpson glove. Right, folks, six hours later, the only moist glove is the glove that was in the Ziploc bag. The one that's actually at the crime scene on the ground is dry. Right? It's dry six hours later. Right here, we're talking about a timeline from about 10.50 at night to 5.30 the next day. Think about it. Understand, too. Furman is out of vision of the other cops at times when they're at Rockingham. Right? Just food for thought. 
Let's talk about Furman a little bit more. Right? And understand too, and this is a very important distinction. We're talking about risk here. Risk. The person doesn't actually have to be prejudiced. The person doesn't have to have a racial bias. When we're looking at the integrity of the evidence, right, we have to ask ourselves about any evidence that suggests that the evidence might have been planted. Then we have to look at the person involved and make a hard decision on whether or not the person has so much credibility that a jury can just assume what they have done was prim and proper. If the cop involved who finds the great piece of evidence has any storm clouds in their past, right? If there are any problems that would lead us to doubt that cop, then that's going to create reasonable doubt, isn't it? Let's look at Furman's background, right? Because understand, for you to believe in the integrity of the bloody glove that Mark Furman found at the Rockingham estate without a search warrant several hours later, two miles away from the murder scene. You have to believe in Mark Furman. Right? Lang and Venatter are not around him the entire night. He jumps the fence, folks. He's alone. Worse yet, we're not going to get into it in this video, but there's some inconsistencies between his preliminary hearing testimony and what he said earlier. So let's look at Mark Furman. Just to understand, 11 years earlier, before the murders, someone at the LAPD was contending that Mark Furman was so troubled and burnt out from dealing with African American gangs that Furman qualified for a disability pension. Right? This person was claiming that Furman was disabled. You want to know who the person was? It's a shocker. This person would have knowledge. It was Mark Furman. He actually applied for a disability pension. This is 11 years before Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman are murdered. Well, let me say this. Just understand he doesn't get the disability pension. That's why he's still on the force in June of 1994. So, of course, over a 10-year period of time, not 10 days, not 10 months, over a 10-year period of time, he was actually speaking with an author Laura McKinney, right? She was doing work for some fictional work on the LAPD. And one of her, her sources was Mark Furman. So, just to understand, O.J. O.J. Simpson is accused of the murder, right, in June of 1994. The murders take place the night of June the 12th, 1994. Let's remember that date, June the 12th, 1994. Just to understand, on July the 18th, 1994, folks, the very next month, 
Furman sits down with Laura McKinney. And he tells McKinney, I'm the key witness in the biggest case of the century. If I go down, they lose the case. The glove is everything. Without the glove, bye-bye. Right? A few minutes later, Furman continues. He says, The funny thing about it, just like the attorney said, for the rest of your life, this is you. Bloody Glove Furman. If you don't make it pay off, you're going to go through all of this for nothing. <laughs> well, let me just say, I believe a reasonable juror off of these comments, we don't even have to get into his use of the N-word. Right? Off of these comments and off of his request for a disability pension. For the stress he received from dealing with Los Angeles gangs. Who happen to be primarily African American. Right? I think Furman's credibility isn't the kind of credibility that a jury could place blind trust in in a murder involving a black male defendant and white murder victims. Right? Understand, there's a reason why we require police to obtain search warrants. It's to prevent cops from going off and finding evidence and then having their credibility questioned. Then when you look into the guy's background, the guy's talking about making this pay off. Sounds like he's looking for some financial windfall down the road, doesn't it? Then, of course, the guy is talking about how without the glove, bye-bye. Understand, the glove had not been fully tested yet when Furman's making these statements. The defense wants you to believe that Furman already knew that this moist glove, moist six and a half hours later, this moist glove that he uncovered without a search warrant, he knew had the blood of the victims on it. Right? Think about it. So, let's just say the O.J. Simpson case has problems. In other words, this is that case where, in my opinion, you have a guilty defendant. I know many of you disagree with me. We'll continue the dialogue in future videos and in the comment section to this video. Right? I believe you have a guilty defendant. But I also believe you have a scene where you have cops, some, someone in the background there, who might be embellishing the evidence. Right? It would have to be an extreme fluke for the blood drops on the bloody socks to match on both sides of the sock as if the blood was dripped on the sock without a foot in the middle of the sock. Let me go one step further. You know, we, we don't know where the murder weapon is. That was never discovered. You have O.J. Simpson's wife at her condo. O.J. visited that condo many times. Right? O.J. recognizable as it is. Even if you don't know O.J.'s celebrity. Nicole lived at Bundy. O.J. visited Bundy. 
No one disputes that. No one disputes that. And so you have a scenario here where O.J. Simpson, with about an hour's worth of time, is supposed to have gone over there, killed his wife, wearing a ski cap, in June, in L.A., certain that no one was going to recognize him. That no neighbors of Nicole's was going to look out and say, hey, that's Nicole's husband. Right? Or ex-husband. Right? It, it, it's just a little bit fluky. Let me say this too. F. Lee Bailey, at the trial, goes over and tries on the gloves. He describes his hands as average. He said the glove barely fit him. Right now, aren't you concerned? Right, that the glove didn't fit O.J. Simpson. Now, I'll agree. A good actor could stretch his hands out. Right, but aren't you concerned with where the gloves were found? Do you believe OJ would take a glove back with him to Rockingham knowing that he's missing the other glove? Is that something you believe? So I agree. OJ's blood is at the murder scene. I don't believe all the blood in the case was planted. Let's remember too, OJ by his own version of events cuts his hand the very night his wife and Ron Goldman are murdered. Right? That by itself should raise red flags. No question about that. But don't you also have concerns about the inconsistent police tapes of the bloody socks isn't there some <laughs> isn't there some blood evidence here that's just openly questionable and isn't the moistness of the glove and the circumstances under which the gloves discovered right isn't that troublesome understand the official police version of events is that they're at the murder scene and then they're concerned about O.J. Simpson. Right? So they then go to Rockingham to make sure the people at Rockingham are safe. Right? Forget the fact that several hours pass. Right? From 10.50 all the way to past 5 in the morning before they make it over to OJ's place, which isn't next door, it's two miles away. And even then, even though they're there in the early morning, these geniuses don't get a search warrant. Right? The theory is they thought the people inside the house were in imminent danger. Do you buy that? Let me hear from you while I think OJ's guilty. I think something went wrong with the police investigation in this case. I don't like the idea of socks magically appearing on later police videos, then the blood on the sock itself looking like it was dripped. And then of course a guy who was who considered himself to be disabled because of dealing with gangs. Suddenly is the person finding a moist, bloody glove more than six hours later without a search warrant two miles away from the murder scene. Right? Outside the view of the other detectives who were there. Understand, no one sees him find a bloody glove. To me, that's disturbing. Does it disturb you? 
does it create enough doubt in your mind where from the jury box you would say, you know, I think this guy did this crime, but this evidence looks fishy to me. And if I can't trust this evidence collected by LAPD, can I trust any evidence collected by LAPD? Let me close by saying this, and we'll deal with this in another video. This O.J. Simpson case has another aspect that a lot of cases don't have. Right? It's who is the defendant. Who is O.J. Simpson? Right? Understand, he seems affable. He seems friendly. You look at the timeline, it's a tight timeline. You find out that the killer is walking around the murder scene. Walking around the murder scene. The injury to his hand. There are drops, at least four drops, of O.J.'s blood at the murder scene. But O.J. has a cover story. The question is whether he is methodical enough to come up with this cover story. The cover story has him in Chicago hearing of his wife's death. And then being so upset that he hits a glass, cuts his hand, bleeds in Chicago. Now keep in mind, nobody when he gets to the airport for I believe it's an American Airlines flight out of LA sees him with a badly cut hand. No one. No one sees the kind of wound that would leave the blood drops at the murder scene. In that moment, is O.J. Simpson the affable, happy-go-lucky guy with nothing really on his mind because as far as he knows, everyone's safe in his family. Or is he the methodical killer I think he is? He's at the airport. He has a mask on. He's cultivating alibi weaknesses. He has a finger that's cut that he somehow is able to hide. No one knows to look for it. Because let me tell you, the police look at his Chicago hotel room. You know what they find? They find broken glass. They find blood. Right? Is O.J. the kind of methodical killer who, knowing he bled at the murder scene, would think things through so when he gets to Chicago, he deliberately cuts his hand and leaves evidence in the room of the cut. So he's on the way back from Chicago. And on the trip back, unlike the trip there, OJ's hand's an obvious mess. People see him with the bloody hand. Is he the kind of thought-out, methodical killer, organized, as profilers say? Is he organized enough to figure out? He needs to mimic the evidence he's left behind at the murder scene. So he has an innocent explanation for it. So when he talks with the police, he can say, yes, my hand was cut, but it was cut in Chicago. And then when they check with the hotel in Chicago, they find evidence that his hand was cut in Chicago. The real question is, was that the only place it was cut? Let me tell you, too. 
OJ has attorneys. They tell him not to talk to the police. This is when he returns from Chicago. OJ then talks with the police. Now the defense wants you to believe that his story dovetails perfectly with Cato Kalin's story. Right? They're in a Bentley. They're at a McDonald's. Right? They come back from the McDonald's. Cato goes to his quarters, starts making calls, Right, OJ supposedly is getting ready to go to the airport to get picked up by a limo. Right? Is OJ organized enough to decide, okay, I'm going to give a statement to the police. I'll have my statement match Cato's without my lawyer present. In fact, I'm going to give the statement so soon after I arrive from Chicago that the police will know that an attorney didn't feed me words to say. And I'm going to be so careful that I'm going to mention all the key points of my alibi. Right? I was with Cato. I came home, I took a shower, I took a nap. I went, I caught a limo. Right? Did he think of all of this before the murders? If you believe he did the murders. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments in the comment section of this video. In sum, I believe OJ is guilty, but I also believe the evidence has problems. I don't trust all of the evidence. I don't like cops who believe they're disabled because of dealing with African American gangs suddenly finding moist gloves more than six hours later without search warrants two miles away from the murder scene. Right? That just doesn't wash with me. Right? Blood dries. The idea that the blood on this glove doesn't dry in six and a half hours, I'm not sure if I buy that. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments.